Cheers. Be seeing you around then. Bye bye. Hey! I ain't good at playing just friends. You know, ain't no one I watch as close as I watch you. The initial reaction to Cyberpunk Edge Runners was actually pretty funny to me. I follow a lot of artists over on my personal Twitter, and as the week progressed, all the art I saw made a distinct shift. It started as all Lucy and quickly morphed into an outright flood of Rebecca. Short, angry, and blunt, the internet had found a new character to sweep up their desires. I understand it, obviously, but I wanted to dig deeper into why, when everyone loves a character so much, I want to know what is driving that love. She isn't a very traditional, attractive design like Lucy, and most of Rebecca's obvious traits aren't things traditionally listed as positive ones. She's crass, rude, dangerous, probably even insane, and constantly fuming at something. But all this creates someone who feels very lively in a world which is the opposite. She's crass and rude because she's direct. There's no time to screw around with being fake. Danger may not be beneficial, but to be close to death, you realize you're alive. And being angry at so much so easily is, if nothing else, a marker of passion. She feels strongly and makes the world witness those feelings. She is alive, and she would probably give you the best night of your life without any bullshit. I mean, our introduction to her is literally distracting a man with, well, let's just say, her hands. She answers the door basically naked with a gun in David's face, gives him a big tip for the delivery, calls him cute, and sends him away. There's wild, aggressive energy in all of this that screams life in a world where no one really feels alive. I think a lot of the love for Rebecca comes from this feeling. She's like a sort of manic pixie character, but not the one who falls in love with you and magically drops everything to fix your life. She's one who says, yeah, everything is awful. I can't change that. But we can focus on something else for a moment, can't we? Watching her in this crew, even with all of the danger, if I lived in their world, I would want to be a part of it to be around that kind of energy, to be near her and see what happened. And this feeling is furthered because with Rebecca, that's all it takes, just being there. Rebecca is someone who takes what she wants. So when she's giving off that feeling of life, she's also the one beginning the process, the initiation of living itself. If she wants to be near you, she will make herself known and vivid and important. This is what we see in her introduction to David. Despite them never actually meeting before, this is the interaction they have. Who are you? Remember? Come on, Chum, after all we've been through. It's as if she was Obi-Wan referencing much cooler adventures we never got to see with Anakin. But there were none. This is one of the most telling lines because it's exactly her and her desires in one package. She knows this is going to make David have to think, immediately putting effort into who she is and remembering it for sure. It makes her stand out. She must be important if you're supposed to remember her and trying to. This introduction isn't, hi, I'm Rebecca. It's, you should know, I'm Rebecca. She makes herself a part of what she wants to, and from there, the doubt is gone. No one wonders, does Rebecca like me? They know. If they want her back, she's right there, standing out, important and memorable as hell. And the series kind of accomplished that in a very meta way, didn't it? I mean, look at anything Edge Runners and see whose face is all over it who has the image and energy that draws people in. A big part of this, though, is dispelling that doubt. If someone throws themselves into your life, you might have some justified concerns about who that person is and why they're doing it. I've had my share of letting people in faster than I should have because my patience is non-existent, and it always comes with a share of pain because you're learning someone after you've committed part of yourself to them. We don't always know who people are, even after days or weeks or months or maybe even years. We just guess and hope. So for someone like Rebecca, who's direct, who takes what she wants, there has to be some avoidance of this. What's the point of taking what you want if it's always going to resist? So what you see is what you get. She's not hiding her bad behavior. There's no front, no lie about what she's feeling deep down because she puts it all out there, good and bad. And this fits with Cyberpunk's live fast, die young world. There is no time to hide who you are. Take months to get to know someone, we might be dead within weeks. 
Usually, deep characters get long scenes exploring their psyche because not many people present exactly as who they are. We have to be uncovered. Rebecca doesn't need one of these because it wouldn't add anything new. It feels like you can connect with her right away. There is nothing which must be approached carefully or with bated breath, despite her danger, because you already know what you're getting into. This is a stark contrast to the rest of the cast. David, Maine, and Lucy all have secrets or denials about parts of themselves which lead them to worsen fates. David and Maine reject the fact that they are not special and hide their cyber psychosis until it's too late. Lucy works in the shadows to save David, informing not even him as she hides from the rest of the crew as well. And even further, then they conflict about what they held back and what they showed. They have these long scenes that we mentioned, and they're painful. David watches his near father figure go insane and die after their last day together was one of just abuse. Lucy and David break up, losing the one thing that kept each of them going because neither of them could be honest. So even with good intentions, they killed what they sought to save. Now what secrets does Rebecca have? What about her isn't present on the surface? Nothing really. Later in the series, she even says directly to David, Hey! I ain't good at playing just friends! Her only long emotional scenes are just reactions to David's. She's probably the happiest in the entire cast, and one of the few whose death wasn't from her actions because she embraced the path they live on, not just walked along it looking up. While everyone else is stuck in their emotions, falling to very stagnant feelings, she's bright and expressive pretty much all the time. It might go from intense anger to outright joy in the drop of a hat, but that's more range than most in Night City have across their lives. And there's a good reason for her to be like that. She moves on from the things she can't help or that aren't relevant, and focuses full on on what's in front of her. It's reflected in the way she throws herself headfirst into danger. Right now is what's important because right now is what can be controlled. If you don't want to die, then fight like hell and maybe you won't. How can anything else matter when you're facing down death like that? She extends this mindset into everything. The moment that showcases it best is in episode 4, when she's stopped from entering the bar, well, because short, and her immediate reaction is to pull her gun and in turn, get many more pulled on her. David sand devastates her in, and from there, without missing a beat, she excitedly starts introducing David to a friend. It's a near instant shift from anger to such genuine joy, and I think that's at least somewhat right. She feels things and doesn't keep them buried inside. As long as you don't use that to hurt people, is it actually bad? She can't change the fact she's sort without replacing her whole body, and we see what happens to the guys like David and Maine who do replace their whole forms. It's clear that her option is the healthier one. She is who she is. She doesn't need to replace her body. And she'll fight to see that it and her are respected as they are. It can't be helped that they stop her right then, but she'll make sure it won't happen again. And when David fixes the issue, it's over and done, so why bother staying focused on that feeling? It won't help anything, so she just lets it go. Everything she feels is brought out immediately, not held inside and stewed on, for better or for worse. She feels what she feels. Can we do anything really but accept that fact? And acceptance is really the key word of her character. I spent all this time saying how Rebecca is so direct, confident, and taking exactly what she wants. But she clearly wants David and never takes him. So is this a conflict in her character? Am I talking out of my ass? No. It's because she has an acceptance of the world she lives within, not just of herself. Let's dip away from David for a moment to explore what shows this best. When Pilar is killed in episode 4, Rebecca goes into a rage. She rushes at the stranger, almost getting herself killed in the process. It's to the point where they have to take her out of commission themselves, her crew, to save her. Yet when the stranger is dead, she shoots him more and yells, It was mine to kill, and you took that from me! This is because she accepted the world she lives in. She is living as best she can by its standards to try and be happy. She knows it's shit. She knows that everyone in the crew is just trying to be happy and that they never really will. That they will all probably die sooner than later because of this quest and that there's nothing they can do to change that. So she takes within reason. She doesn't grasp at things which she can't have. She doesn't wish for something that will get her killed. Rebecca doesn't live beyond her means like David and Maine. 
This includes treasuring her family. She could never help her brother be happy, and he would have always died because, well, Night City. But she could be the one who killed him at least. She could end him when it was too much, or when it was only downhill and happiness was gone for good. It's morbid because their world is morbid, and no one can live in a different world than the one they're in. It makes itself a part of us. Rebecca maintains herself on the small things their world forgot to steal away, because what else is she going to do? Simple joys can be found in anything, no matter how fucked up. She finds them, and that's part of how she's able to move on from events and emotions so quickly. There'll be another small joy around the corner to fulfill her, at least for a bit. So there's no point in stewing in sadness. All it does is mean you still die, but without good stuff to look back on. Can we blame someone for just wanting to live their life, not having to sacrifice it all to change the world? But she's clearly aware of the other options and sees them as legitimate. Happiness for some may only come from a changed world. Although she takes what she wants, Rebecca knows that everyone is just trying to accomplish the same goal in their own ways. And taking everything would mess that up for them and make her nothing more than kind of a walking corporation the consumption of others' lives for one's gain. She knows that going all in on something you want, like David does, is dangerous. It destroys your acceptance, as it did with hers, and drains you of everything in the hopes of something almost impossible. She is direct, but she leaves room built in for someone else to confirm if what she's doing would destroy their world to build hers. She makes herself clear, but never closes any door. Let's look at how. When David is sitting in the bar, she plops down next to him way closer than a friend would and starts chugging. With this and her intro and many other things, it's extremely clear that she would love something more from David. But outright taking someone else is messy, especially in a group like that. So she gives David everything he needs to know the situation exactly and act, and then sees if he will. It's basically being clear and asking for his consent but never making things awkward either by doing too full force about it because that door is never closed. Neither ever actually needs to say no or yes, but it's always there. And if a no comes, this wasn't her whole life, she wasn't all in, so like anything else, she can accept it and move on. Her being isn't tied to any one thing like that, like we've seen some of the others. Rebecca isn't fucking around playing some game of cat and mouse, She's living the way that this world demands and giving others the chance to join in and live true with her. Night City is cruel. Even if you want something really bad, committing yourself to it is only a liability. David and Lucy make this obviously clear as each is manipulated through the other. You can't do that with Rebecca. Take her family hostage? She was going to be the one to kill them anyway. She's learned this world inside and out, accepted it, and plays around it to be happy without fucking up anyone else's shit. They live in a neat little ecosystem right on the edge of this world. You don't want to shake something like that up when it's a positive thing for you and others. As Rebecca is watching David, she's seeing him watch Lucy. She knows this. She knows what he wants and that it's not what she does. Why demand an answer that would only mess up a good thing for everyone? We often see these ultimated moments as a good thing, where someone moves past obsession and gets back on with growing and changing, no longer feeling a pain they've been inflicting on themselves. Sometimes that is true, but that pain is their choice. We don't have to close every door to keep moving forward through other ones. I've said a lot this year that all we can expect from a good person is to act selfishly in the way which hurts other people the least. And this is what we see from Rebecca. She puts herself first, but not if it's going to hurt her friends. She takes what she wants within reason. This is the difference between an awful person and one who's moral within the context of our world. We have to live with a bit of pain to receive the benefit of living with others because we'll never align exactly on desires. She's still human. She's still pissed at Lucy for capturing David's heart and then fucking it up and pissed at him for messing up his own life because of this. But it's what they chose. She has no right to change that. She'll make it clear she wants to. As David slides over the edge, she objects many times. But what else can be done? Can someone seeking happiness object to someone else doing the same in a way affecting only themselves? 
Everyone's trying to be fulfilled in a world without fulfillment. When they save Lucy, she looks back with a shitty look on her face and says, Glad you're back safe. For David's sake, I mean. Which is perfect. She couldn't care less which way it went for someone who left them behind. But she loves David, and David loves her. So she accepts it and fights like hell with him, and her selfishness led her to save someone. One of her objections to David's downfall says more than most anything else, though. When she tells him, You know, ain't no one I watch as close as I watch you. I think it says a lot more. It's her brand of directness, but with the door open. It's putting what she feels out there and being honest, but respecting his wishes as well. And it doesn't just showcase all of her traits, it shows how she makes them work in the first place. Careful observation. The life she lived, the kind of excitement and connection that was within it, isn't free like we so often think it is. Getting out and being the life of the party, learning to move on and be happy, those aren't things that come as naturally as we might think. People aren't just born doing that. They come from awareness, careful consideration of other people, the world, and yourself. To do what she does, you have to be able to judge every interaction as best as possible, to know if it's the right time to take what you want, to know how it will affect everyone involved because you care about them. You have to observe a lot before that point to have a frame of reference for how those things will go. There's not many things which are effortless. They're simply things which appear so. Someone random talks to you and it seems like a split second decision. But how do you know they weren't working up the courage for hours? When you're so direct and blunt, doors can close really quickly. Doing it right isn't just saying everything that's on your mind. It's processing it all and communicating it effectively. If you just shout, no one will like you. You have to shout with meaning. The world doesn't want her to be happy. But no system can crush everything. There will always be things missed, pockets to be uncovered. She found those things, which is no small task, when they were all supposed to be gone. We can't expect to live like she does or glom onto her for free. She has pain like anyone else. And she fights through that pain. I pointed this moment out before, but it fucking kills me every time, so I'm gonna do it again. When David has fully lost his sanity, speaking to his mother's memory in the middle of the largest fight yet, she drops her anger, puts on a soft smile, saying this. All right, David, let's go. And then goes back to fighting like hell. If seeing that hurts, imagine what feeling it does. Seeing someone who was so important to you destroy themselves, knowing only death awaits them, and then being able to do nothing about it, and still fighting. I would have quit, I would have given up long before that because it was all over. I would have thrown a tantrum and rejected the world before me. That's the easy way of dealing with pain, just giving in and letting it control you. You should let yourself feel it and process it, but there's always tomorrow, always the next fight ahead. Rebecca does what she always does and keeps fighting. Even if it hurts, she accepts it. What else can be done? Fight for now and the rest will come as it will. Living true is hard. It's not really allowed or even wanted by the holders of power in this world, but we try anyway because if it's gonna hurt no matter what, why not make it hurt in a way we choose? The process of being human is suffering. Because we are never satisfied, we will keep growing. One cannot occur without the other. Every evil corporation started as one person who wanted a better life, but was never satisfied enough to stop at the one they found. This doesn't justify their actions, but it puts them in context. It shows the cycle they feed, and it shows what we have to overcome, how we have to grow past this feeling to evolve as a species, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally. We are destined to suffer, so how do we live with it? Rebecca offers us her answer, and it's one I've seen a lot. I see it in good people, great people, people I really love, people who want to change the world, but also want to be happy, who don't want to spend their entire life struggling to maybe not even succeed at that goal and then realize they had just wasted it all and not been happy. So they accept the world as it is and make their own happiness in the ways allowed, usually in simple pleasures. It's a space of their own or picking up new arts and crafts or a love right next to them at night, maybe a simple walk to appreciate the beautiful world, being bold and brave to wear their inside on the outside, writing their experiences in the hopes the world will one day learn from them. They aren't inherently happier than anyone else because of these things they allow themselves. 
but they're trying. They're trying so fucking hard to be. I've seen it in the long nights I've spent with them, whether it was just hanging out or talking or studying or working, whatever it is. I've heard it in their voice over calls, felt it in their body as we lay there together with some of them. They're trying so hard and they're not fucking happy. How, how even with all that effort, not even directed outside to affect others, not selfishness at all, but the simple want for joy in trying to have it, how does our world crush even that? This isn't what the end of this video was supposed to be, but as I was going through and rewriting a few sections, I realized I can't keep this in. I will scream until the whole world fucking listens to it. I want the people I love to be happy. I am unhappy, but I know why I am. I don't want to be. I don't want to be happy until this world makes room for everyone to be happy, not just a select few. I know if I slow down and take in the small pleasures, I'll grow to love them, to want them more and more, and grow complacent in never changing the world because of them. So I do not want to be happy, even as I wish everyone could be. I understand why my pain exists. But I don't understand one bit why theirs must. I don't understand why it's so impossible to be happy even for the people who are trying so goddamn hard. Why aren't they allowed to be happy? Why do I still hear them cry, feel them tremble, and read their words of despair when they're trying their hardest and that should be fucking rewarded? I can't stand for a world which doesn't reward such genuine effort. I can't stand for a world which hurts people I love just for existing. Everything which is built has been built to break us. This video was supposed to end by saying Rebecca's way is probably better. To take pride and passion in small joys because we see how changing the world or living beyond your means ends. But Rebecca fucking dies too. Someone who accepted the world wasn't even safe from it because she loved someone and fought for them because that was one of the things she took small pleasure in. I've seen her method work no better than David's. I've seen people I love be no happier than me. Maybe the default state of the human race is suffering. Maybe from the day our brains formed, the first thought we were doomed to a hell on earth. But what the fuck is the point of everything we've done if it doesn't even attempt to make us happy? What good is a fucking skyscraper with no one in it is happy? What if we ruin the earth for convenience sake only to not let people use that extra time to be happy? What's the reason for advancing when we never advance in the direction of joy even when so many are fucking trying to? There's a reason worlds like Edge Runners can be set so many years in the future and still be unhappy because we are not progressing towards fucking happiness. I don't know which way to tell you to try and be happy. I wish I could be more hopeful. I wish I could end this hopefully because I don't want to make people depressed. I just want them to be happy. But all I can say is think about it. Think about your own happiness and all the efforts towards it. Think about everyone else doing the same. Think about everyone I know and everyone you know who cries. Think about the world which led to those conditions to make everything like this. Is it one that you want to keep existing as it is?